Uh, the Gulen movement, interesting movement, because uh, they combine contradictory characteristics uh, to some level. On the one hand, they're extremely well organized, as you can see, in the way in which this conference has been conducted, but also they're very spontaneous and dynamic. Um, uh, there's a spirit of that dynamism and spontaneity. They've asked me to present the paper today, which I was originally supposed to present tomorrow. Uh, but I accepted, of course, in the spirit of tolerance, acceptance, forgiveness. Uh, and I know that they will reciprocate with the same uh, values when they give me uh, more flexible time in making the presentation. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, I begin with the title, Promoting Human Rights Values in the Muslim World. Uh, the case of the Gulen movement. Um, as a human rights lawyer and academic myself, my interest in the Gulen movement is its potential to effectuate real change at the ground level on the front of human rights law and human rights values. Um, and so hence I began from that point of view. But I quickly realized that before I could answer the specific question of human rights in the Muslim world, I had to look at the general question of can the Gulen movement effectuate or influence anything in the Muslim world? So I began to go at the literature, and I was expecting to find a body of literature there, but it was not, unfortunately. And so I quickly realized that if I wanted to stick to the, to the same specific theme that I have here, I had to do the groundwork and first contextualize Gulen's potential influence in the Muslim world. Hence the paper is in three sections. The first looks at the underlying dynamics of Gulen's influence and the underlying nature of his tajdid, his renewal and revival. And the logic is very simple. If you want to understand and predict whether Gulen's influence is transferable, you have to understand uh, what the, the nature of that influence is. Uh, the second part then looked at his discourse on human rights values. And the question was, well, OK, let's assume for a second that this influence is transferable, as I suggest in part one. What will that mean for human rights values? And then I look at those values in Gulen's thought and discourse. And then on the third part, I try to bring this together in the Muslim world, because when looking at Gulen's influence, I suggest that um, Gulen's influence is largely dependent on the Gulen movement. Yes, there are three dynamics, three uh, characteristics that make Gulen immensely influential, and that is that he is a spiritually devout intellectual artist. And with the combination of these characteristics, you have uh, a transformative edge. Uh, and these characteristics are also exhibited in the movement. And hence, I suggest that you have miniature Gulens wandering around who are well-educated and have some kind of degree, well-read in theology, but also uh, fulfill a spiritual life that uh, Father Thomas Michel mentioned in the Dev Science. Um, so Gulen influences the people, and he attracts a following. Uh, so he influences the movement, and then the movement influences the wider society, the periphery. So Gulen's influence is dependent really on the movement. And so in the third part, I'm looking at where is the movement in the Muslim world? Is it there? Is it going there? Uh, and hence I try to put the preceding two parts together. If explaining that took a time, I'm not going to have the time to actually go into detail in all of those parts. So I'm going to skip part one in its entirety, and also part three, and just look at here, uh, with the limited amount of time that I have, at human rights values in Gulen's thought. And there are three subheadings here. Um, the inherent value of human rights in Gulen's thought, uh, so far as freedom of choice and willpower being concerned. So that's the first. And the second is the contingent value of human rights in Gulen's thought, so far as personal and social development are concerned. And the third is the content of Gulen's human rights, and I call that metaphysical human rights. I also want to say a bit about um, freedom of belief and Gulen's incremental ijtihad on the uh, capital punishment for apostasy in Islamic law. So I I've asked Ian to, to mark me when I get to uh, my last seven minutes so I can skip to that very end, if, if I haven't got there already. And, and in collating and categorizing Gulen's views into these three, four subsections, um, what, what I've done is I've really read Gulen's views that he's expressed at different times and through different mediums. And I've tried to collate them and, and, and make some sense uh, of them in the way in which I have. So I begin with the inherent value of human rights in Gulen's thought. And we begin at the beginning. 
all beauty and all fairness require to see and be seen. And those who are well read in Tasawwuf will know this. Those who, uh, I'm sure most of you who've read uh, the Risale Nur will know that that's exactly a quote from there. All beauty and all fairness require to see and be seen. And Gulen adopts this understanding as well. And it's called the mirror concept. And the basic understanding is God is all beautiful, God is all fair. He has an infinite number of beautiful names and an infinite number of beautiful attributes. And he wanted to see those infinite number of attributes and he wanted them to be seen. So he created, he manifested himself, his names and his attributes. We spoke a bit about this in the morning. His names and his attributes through creation, so the universe. But then he wanted it to be seen. So he created humans, humans who have intelligence, who have conscious, conscientious, uh, who have a soul, uh, who can extrapolate, reason, relate, who can go from the created to the creators, Rumi would say, who can marvel at the majesty of God, uh, who can begin to know God, and through knowing God, begin to worship God, and, and through worshiping God, to arrive at an awareness of God, at a relationship with God, which will lead to love of God, and eventually that will lead to greater knowledge and more worship, and you have a virtuous circle. And as Ghazali says, you have worship of God through love, which is the highest level of worship, or the highest level of relationship with God. And that, that is why humans were created, explains Gulen and, and Nursi. And they, again, the, the, the two uh, faith-based movement leaders also suggest and state that what makes humans human is the element of choice. That's what differentiates man from angels. Choice is the magical switch. It turns everything on. As Nursi says, it turns the lights on in the palace and you see the chandelier. That's significant, it's important, because God wants to be chosen. Compare, if you will, a student who uh, is forced to study, has no option but to study, and one who chooses to study, and the value and the difference between the two. So, humans are defined by choice. Gulen then suggests slightly more here that choice can only operate if you have freedom. Yeah, think of the best car, and that would be Porsche Carrera 911 for me. Beautiful car, but no road to drive it on. Meaningless. That's what, that's what choice and freedom is. So you need freedom for choice to have value. And Gulen then emphasizes, especially post uh, his visits to the US uh, there, that freedom is guaranteed by human life. Wow, so you have this interesting concentric circles, one within the other. Let's briefly go through them. So you have the universe that was created and only has meaning if you have humans. Humans are only human if you have choice. Choice is only meaningful if it can operate in a free, free and fair society. A free and a fair society is only guaranteed if you have human rights. So on the one level, Gulen is connecting this uh, faith-neutral concept of human rights with a faith perspective of the universe. So, at one level, if you don't have human rights, you upset the balance of creation. And I think that's quite powerful. I think that's a significant uh, link that Gulen uh, is making there. The contingent value, I move swiftly on. Um, human rights for personal and social development. In order to have a relationship with God, a believer has to strive to be what we call insani kyaami, the perfect person. That's perfection in belief, thought, and practice. And as uh, my, my friend explained, Gulen redefines taqwa as following the laws of religion, which God has set. But who set the laws of causality, the laws of nature? And if you fail to follow the laws of nature and causality, then how are you following and being obedient to your Lord? So uh, he suggests the Muslim is more that. The Western world is more Muslim than the Muslim world because it has achieved to understand and follow the laws of causality in nature, also uh, ordained by God, whereas the Muslim world has not. And that's interesting. So if you want social development, you need freedom, says Gulen. If you want spiritual development, you need freedom. So the contingent value of human rights is that it allows people to progress, social development. And he says, true freedom is the freedom of the human, human mind from all shackles that hinder it from making material and spiritual progress as long as we do not fall into indifference and to heedlessness. So he puts a special emphasis on free thinking. We have to achieve to become free thinkers. And there you have human rights, which is very significant. Metaphysical human rights. And this is the content of human rights for Gulen. And this is... Um, 
This is what we call kulhaqi in Turkish. And it's a very basic Islamic concept that God will not forgive the transgression that you commit against another person on the day of judgment unless that person, the, the transgressed, forgives first. And this is from the most simple to the most uh, enforceable. So the right not to be tortured is a right in Islam as well, but the right not to be backbitten, ghibet, is also an equally strong right. The right not to have somebody think of you in a lesser light, suizan, is also uh, a human right, explains Gulen. So the human rights concepts in, in the way which Gulen and other scholars have explained include metaphysical, unenforceable rights as well. But Gulen extends this. He says, for example, non-payment of utility bills, the charge of which will be picked up by your neighbors, is a transgression of the human rights of your neighbors. Uh, avoiding council tax, likewise. We're all academics. Plagiarism, likewise. <laughs> These are, ex so what Gulen is doing is he, he's extending the scope of unenforceable human rights uh, as we understand it. And so I think that's, that's quite significant. Incremental uh, ishtihad in the making, apostasy in Islam, and that's the uh, final uh, topic that I want to attempt to tackle. Um, freedom of belief has always been a very tricky topic uh, for, the, for the Muslim world. And if you look at the uh, ICCPR, the International Covenant of Civil Political Rights uh, debate, if you look at the Universal Declaration and the debates that surrounded that in the 1940s, 1948, you will find that uh, Muslim countries and their leaders were saying, that we can't accept freedom of belief in the way in which you have put it here. And the exact difficulty relates to the inherent concept in freedom of belief, and that is the right to change religion. You really don't have freedom of belief if you don't have the right to change religion. So you had a very big struggle there uh, between Islamic states and, uh, and other parties who were in favor of this. Um, the conventional position in Islamic law, whether we can say that there is such a thing as Islamic law, but the conventional position is that a murtad, an apostate, uh, is punishable uh, with death in Islamic law. That's a conventional starting point. Now, last year I attended a conference in Germany where Dr. Ahmed Kurujan, a personal student of Fethullah Gulen and also a columnist of the Zaman Daily newspaper who's known <coughs> to be the teacher of the movement if you like, on <coughs> Islamic jurisprudence. I think it's important to underline that. He gave a conference and he spoke about dialogue and many other things and some, some chap asked a question about this position, apostasy uh, in, in Islam. And he said, uh, he said, the death penalty for an apostate in, this, in Islamic law is an ijtihad. Whoa, you could see the reactions in the room at the time. And he said, it's not a definite commandment of Islam. He said, therefore, it can be superseded by another ijtihad today. He explained, he said, the pre-modern jurists who had an ijma, a consensus on this issue, and you have that in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, uh, arrived at this when uh, the communities were deeply divided over Islam, uh, when Muslims were uh, under political and physical siege, when you were either a Muslim defending Islam or a non-Muslim attacking it. That was the context. At least that's the context as they saw it. Uh, and you can see that from the reasoning of the jurists. For the jurists at the time, apostasy meant rebellion, a political form of rebellion, and joining forces against the Muslims. There are a number of incidents, indeed, uh, quoted uh, Kurujan, that at the time when apostates, subs that, that apostates subsequently took arms against the Muslims to justify this, uh, this position. So in Kurujan's understanding, apostasy uh, was equal to high treason. And so therefore the uh, ijtihad of an execution, executing capital punishment for an apostate, is in relation to his political high treason, not his mere uh, renouncing of the faith. And I, I, subsequently, I thought that's quite interesting as a human rights lawyer and doing a PhD on freedom of belief, I subsequently read his uh, thesis and very briefly he says the Quran makes no references to temporal punishment from apostate in Islam. And in, indeed there are 59 references to apostate, apostasy in the Quran, but nowhere does it say anything about temporal punishment 
uh, for an apostate in any shape or form, regardless of uh, not alone capital punishment. To the contrary, we all know that the very famous verse, there is no compulsion in religion. Um, there are a number of incidents in the time of the prophet when apostates went without any punishment whatsoever. Um, he explains in his thesis that much of the Ijtihad was based on uh, the communal apostasy, if you like, in the time of Abu Bakr. Um, one interesting position, again, uh, is that in the Hanafi school of thought, um, the scholars there explained that a woman, a, a female apostate, should not be put to death uh, because she cannot take arms against the Muslims. Interesting, it sheds light on the understanding and the thought process in the mind of the jurists at the time. But this was about people who would apostatize and then take arms against Muslims. That was their, their thinking. Um, so Kurujan explains that, we, that apostasy can no longer, or apostate can no longer be charged with that same kind of meaning. Whether we agree with, Gulet, with uh, Kurujan's reasoning here is irrelevant. Whether we think theologically this is flawed, that's different. The point is, um, Kurujan is using uh, Islamic terminology, methodology, sources to reinterpret and re-justify a position. And it's the perception that, for me, as a, as a human rights lawyer, that is important. Because if you can get sufficient number of people to believe that this is the case, then that is the case. Uh, and Gulen has the critical mass following, which he can change through the thought process of a number of people who will start to believe this. And if you look at their, their reasoning, it, it sounds quite reasonable uh, to, to somebody like me. Where is the, uh, the incrementalism in, in all of this? Well, I then did some further research and realized that in 1970s, Gulen, uh, in, in answer to a question, and he would give question and answer sermons at a mosque, uh, which were later transliterated into four volumes called Asrin Getirdi the question this modern age puts to Islam, two volumes of which have been translated into English. Now in one of those, the one which hasn't yet uh, been translated, Gulen speaks about this issue. So he says, freedom of belief, you have to allow people the freedom to choose. Forcing, coercing people to believe or worship is against the very fabric of belief and worship, and it leads to hypocrisy, which is much worse. Um, so he says that, and then he very, very passingly refers to this issue of apostasy in Islam, and he, sa he treats it, uh, the conventional position as his own. He doesn't criticize it, but he adds something which is significant, and I think that is what Kurujan has developed. He says that apostasy uh, was equated with high treason and a political rebellion at the time, and that's it. He leaves it there. So we have that in the 1970s, and in the 1990s, those who know about the movement that we've heard today the panel, uh, the, the, the movement began interfaith and intercultural dialogue. Gulen began these initiatives. He also uh, met with a number of different religious minority groups in, in Turkey. And that, you see, that doesn't fit or sit very favorably with this issue of apostasy. In the year 2000 and onwards, uh, the Abant meetings of the Writers and Journalists Foundation, they kicked in. And in a number of those, uh, of those Abant meetings and the declarations that were sub subsequently published, you find this emphasis on freedom of belief, on human rights. So you find, again, this incremental approach of, of expanding the understanding among Muslims on this most crucial point. And now we have, in, in the year 2006, I came across uh, this particular approach, uh, Kurujan. I understand that he's going to be publishing his book uh, very soon. The fact that he's a personal student of Gulen and the sensitivity of this topic suggests to me that he would not have taken this stance unless it was something that he thought Gulen would approve. So uh, you have this slow but incremental change of thought that is, that is taking place. Um, this isn't original to Gulen or Kurujan in any shape or form. A number of scholars have said this in the past. What difference, I think, is between the two of them is perhaps Kurujan and Gulen are developing a more systematic, methodological approach in terms of Islamic uh, law. Uh, and also they have, as I said uh, at the beginning, they have a, a following uh, that will carry on. That doesn't mean that the challenge uh, or the, um, the support for this uh, punishment for apostasy in Islamic law will crumble away. Remember that those who are keeping this uh, and wanting to hold on to this are the political leaders. And they're really not that interested in theology or religion. If you can control 
who is an apostate, if you can suggest that an apostate, uh, an apostate should be put to death, then you have political power. And we see how, how they're using that. So it won't crumble away. But Gulen is hitting away, the move that are hidden away slowly, uh, but, but continuously at uh, those religiously couched dogmas uh, in order to expand uh, the, the thinking in this particular area. Prerequisites for human rights uh, values uh, or human rights in itself, I would suggest, is democracy or democratic values, uh, a rejection of political Islam, a rejection of the theo theocratic Islamic state, <coughs> and so forth. And Gulen has done a number of things uh, on this. And I'll say just a few things about democracy, and, and that will be it. In 1994, when uh, our political leaders were standing up and saying, Democracy is a means to an end. Gulen said at the uh, Journalists and Writers Foundation, democracy is not perfect, but it's the best system we have. There will be no reverse from democracy. And I remember, I'll be honest here, taking off my uh, academic uh, cap for a moment, I was a, a teenager at the time. Um, I was wondering, you know, democracy, human rights, these are good things, surely, right? Um, but I'm a Muslim, does that mean I can, can I accept these two values? Can they coexist? And it was the credibility of somebody like Gunan, who at the beginning, as I said, who is a spiritually devout, intellectual article, who could bring all of those various uh, things together. And the fact that he said, yes, you can, was sufficient for somebody like me to think, OK, well, that's OK, then I don't have a problem. I don't have an identity crisis anymore. I can be this, I can be at home in, in Britain, enjoy my tea with milk, uh, you speak to my children in English, read Charles Dickens, but at the same time, you know, uh, take my shoes off when I go uh, home and X, Y, and Z, whatever it is that makes me turn Christian Muslim. And I think that's very important uh, and significant. And I think that um, looking at the paper in its entirety, uh, these are the things that the, that the movement is bringing to the Muslim world. Uh, and hopefully through their example, uh, things will perhaps uh, change. Thank you very much.